Who's Dr. Degani? So he is a pediatric emergency physician and he works at Surrey Memorial Hospital and BC Children's Hospital. He has a strong interest in medical education and simulation-based learning. He has been involved in organizing continuing medical ed education courses and conferences for peers and colleagues for several years now. He's a great teacher, I've learned from him. And he's gonna speak to us today about pediatric procedural pain and anxiety, the crying child whisperer. Thanks, Naveed. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, uh, am very pleased uh, and honored to get this opportunity to speak to you about this uh, topic. This is not my area of expertise, and so I, uh, this was an opportunity for me to research this area, the area that I personally struggle with uh, each time I do a shift. How do you manage pain and anxiety in children? Um, and it, I've learned a great deal from the study um, of the evidence around the area. Um, I just want to mention that there is no affiliation, sponsorships, or declarations for this talk. So uh, what I thought we should do is uh, speak uh, about acute pain. We're not going to uh, address chronic pain. And uh, to, to give it a pediatric twist, we're going to focus more on uh, physical, psychological, non-pharmacological means of managing pain and anxiety in children, which would be more unique to the pediatric population. So we deliberately spend less time on the pharmaco pharmacology of pain control, because you all deal with this and you're, uh, you have expertise in this area. So we, I thought we should focus in more on the non-pharmacological measures. Um, and then at the end, we'll speak a little bit about anesthesia safety considerations in children. Um, as a way of introduction, why do we treat pain? In addition to the humanitarian, the ethical aspect of um, treating pain and distress in children, another important reason we treat pain is if you don't treat pain, it will create this pain memory in the child that leads to more pain and distress with future uh, encounters uh, in healthcare facilities and emergency rooms. This is a really important issue. Um, in fact, this was put to a very uh, landmark seminal um, study in the 1990s by the Tadio uh, and colleagues, where they looked at the pain response in babies um, due to vaccination, and they compared the group that were circumcised to the group that weren't circumcised. And they looked at how they responded to pain subsequently of vaccination. And uh, what they were able to demonstrate is, as you can see, with uh, uh, statistical significance, this dramatic result, that those uh, infants that were circumcised uh, without analgesia had a much more impressive pain response when they received their two and four month immunization, vaccination. Whereas the ones that weren't circumcised, they had a much better pain response. So they were able to use this as evidence that uh, untreated or undertreated pain can result in more pain, more distress with future encounters. So how you treat pain in a child will have not only implication for, the, for that time and the experience of uh, pain in, at that setting, but also in the future setting. And so this diagram kind of uh, demonstrates that. You can see here that uh, untreated or undertreated or recurrent pain combines with these individual factors like temperament, coping, developmental age, uh, genetic and environmental factors to create pain memory, which then uh, leads to that particular pain response that you're seeing. You might have noticed some children have, are super sensitive to pain. Well, it may be a pain memory that uh, 
was formed uh, during a previous encounter that may have led to that sensitivity, in addition to some genetic and environmental factors. So I, I think we'd like to focus now on how to intervene and what measures you use. And um, starting from simple principles, it's the physical measures. And these involved sensory input. Basically what you're doing is you're increasing sensory input um, and overwhelming their sensory afferent stimuli in an attempt to blunt the pain that they experience. So these involve that tactile skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, breastfeeding is a very simple but very effective measure of reducing pain, anxiety, and distress. And the components of breastfeeding, which we'll uh, get to later, includes that skin-to-skin, -skin, the warmth, the sensation of the sweet taste, um, and then the motor activity of sucking, all provide extra sensory and motor input to the child that then mitigate the pain, and that's how it works. So this was demonstrated nicely by uh, Larry Gray and colleagues, where they looked at um, a cohort of infants um, as far as a needle-based procedure in the emergency room was concerned. Uh, the uh, group in question had skin-to-skin -skin contact, and the controls didn't. And so you can see this fairly impressive, statistically significant um, change in cry and grimace um, in the uh, group that had the skin-to-skin -skin contact uh, and was breastfed uh, compared to the controls. You may be thinking that, uh, well, may, may they're feeling the pain, but they don't express the pain. Uh, so this group, what they did is they actually looked at physiological parameters. So they looked at heart rate. So that lower graph shows the heart rate. And you can see in the breastfed babies, they had just a slight increase in baseline in their heart rate when they were breastfed and receiving this needle-based procedure. So this basically demonstrated quite effectively that breastfeeding really works. It's very simple, and it works. So if uh, bar graphs don't convince you, this is a video from uh, Chio that demonstrates this. I hope I can play it for you here. Yes. Very simple, very effective. So you might have uh, rightly noted these components of breastfeeding that contribute to this uh, touch. There's that tactile component, the warmth, the sweet taste, the sucking, that motor sucking, that may be contributing to this mitigation, this blunting of pain effect that you see. And uh, again, uh, if you look at each one of these components independently, you, uh, this group was able to prove that independently all of these components can reduce pain and mitigate pain. So here, this graph shows contact um, leads to decreased expression of pain. What this group then did is looked at pacifier, which sort of uh, simulates the breastfeeding. And in the pacifier group um, in red, there was a reduction in crying time. And then when you add the sweet taste with sucrose, to the pacifier, you see in yellow that in fact there was a further reduction in response, pain response and crying time. So these uh, components individually, independently contribute to this pain medication phenomenon and they have an additive, there's an additive component. 
Again, uh, we'll demonstrate this uh, pacifier with sucrose effect in this uh, video from Shio. Can you move your shoulder down? Your left shoulder, sorry. That was perfect. Sorry. Good job. Seriously? That was amazing. That was crazy. <laughs> Good job, Samuel. Good job, Samuel. Seriously? Oh. Good job, Samuel. Good job, Samuel. So you can see that he hardly noticed there was a needle there. In fact, I think he had a smile on his, on his face when he received the needle. Um, it's quite dramatic what you can see. Turning our attention to the psychological components uh, and psychological measures, here we have distraction, position of comfort, uh, being aware of the child's temperament and development, being mindful of the parent's response. Those are all contributing factors. Using the appropriate language, it's really key. And this one voice phenomenon, which we'll try to demonstrate for you. This is again a video showing the impact of distraction using a tech-based um, interactive system. I didn't come all the way from Colorado to give babies. I came to New York to follow my dreams. This is where dreams come true. All right, I'm just going to feel that big push we talked about. Okay, bud? I'll count to three again for you. One, two, three. Big push. Are you going to sing the song for us? Hey, Jesse. <laughs> all right, we're all done. We just have tape and stickers left, okay? Hey, Jesse. <laughs> Squeeze came off. little cold drink of water for your straw. Notice that... Um, uh, in this method of distraction, there was this uh, interaction involved. So the child was involved, uh, interacted with the iPad. And in fact, uh, if you look at uh, different um, uh, methods of distraction, um, when there is an active distraction where they're interacting, then uh, they have uh, a more favorable pain response compared to, say, watching a cartoon. Uh, where they're just passively looking at a cartoon. And that graph demonstrates that the red indicating cartoon with respect to pain. In this one study, when, when they looked at perioperative anxiety in children, video game outperformed midazolam <laughs> when they used a... Um, an objective anxiety score. You can see children that use the video game did better than the midazolam group. Um, so I'm going to play this video, and then we're going to try to analyze the components that led to this encounter. Two, three. <laughs> yeah. ah. Let's do mine. One, two, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the mommies. One, two, three. Good. Yeah. Right. Daddy's got your arms. Whoa, we don't like this. What's that? A one, a two, a ray. Good. Yeah. All right. Is it a one, a two, a ray? Good. Yeah. Okay. 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 Bend it. It's a bend it. Bend it. Bend it. Let's your band-aids. Let's say, mm. <laughs> let's get this one on. You're going to take it right off. I know you guys. You take them right off. We'll take this and mm. good. <laughs> All right. Clean up. Clean up. Everybody do this here. Clean up. So, um, um, I mean, not every encounter uh, happens like that, but uh, if we were to analyze different components that may have led to a successful, painful encounter here, 
At first, there was this uh, position of comfort. So placing the child on a uh, parent, that was a positive thing. Second, there was very e effective use of sound and play and touch. Um, that uh, it became more like a play. He was playing a game with, with him. And then the third thing is this uh, practitioner clearly knows, clearly understands the temperament, the developmental stage of this child. And so all of those components led to that effective encounter. It's been shown that up to 50% of the pain response that you see in children is directly related to the way parents respond to their child receiving a painful uh, stimulus, up to 50%. So it's really important to be aware of it. And uh, sometimes having a little chat with the family about effective ways of mitigating pain might help you. So without going into each one of these in detail, pain promoting behavior by parents or excessive reassurance, giving control, excessive empathy, apologies, and criticism. Whereas pain reducing behaviors are if you talk about other stuff, if you use humor, if you provide coping prompts, and some of the parents uh, need to be coached on this, and explaining the procedure using simple terms and terminology. So you know when you are having a conversation with a dog, often they only hear their own name, as demonstrated on this cartoon. The same applies when you're having a conversation with a child. You may be saying all the right things, but if you're using words like hurt, pain, even if you use it in a negative sense, this won't hurt at all. All they're hearing is the word hurt, or pain, or needle. So it's very important that you pay special attention to the words that you use when you're actually performing something like a laceration repair. This um, shows a, when things don't go quite as you would like. And I have certainly been in these circumstances situations before. You see how chaotic it is. Everyone's talking. Everyone's doing different things. This is the one right. voice phenomenon. Doing the washing. You're getting ready. OK, now what's the important thing to remember? Position of comfort. Get your hand up here and keep it away from the IV. She'll let you know. One, two, three. She'll, she'll count for you, OK? <laughs> He's squeeze using a squeeze ball okay, now, Christian, to distract and blow it out for me. Good job. Another one. Again. Blow it out. Only one person's talking. Uh, do the iPad now, but that over while she's doing the rest of her work. She's going to take it up for you. Yeah. What do you want to do on here, buddy? I can't remember what game it is. And I know you like to how peaceful and more calm this feels. So I think um, I'd like to spend the last few minutes of this presentation talking a little bit about medication. First, I think it's important to keep in mind that you use your physical and psychological measures as discussed in conjunction with your pharmacology. If you're deciding to treat pain, treat it early, promptly, 
reassess this phenomenon, this uh, thinking that uh, treating pain early might alter your diagnostic capacity has not been shown to be valid. And giving NSAIDs for orthopedic injuries does not impair bone healing, as used to be thought. And it's most effective in the first three days after the injury. First, a brief word about um, topical um, ways of providing anesthesia. A LET, which is the mixture of lidocaine, epinephrine, and tetracaine, or LAT, <laughs> is quite effective. And if it's not the only agent that you use, it'll actually make it easier to make the injection. These other um, uh, topical um, uh, locals like EMLA and Amatop, they have micron size droplets, so they provide depth up to five millimeter. So they're very ideal for perioperative procedures, venipuncture, puncture, et cetera. And uh, they take longer to take effect, but they, their effect can last longer. And then the vapor coolants are used in more emergency settings where you're doing a septic workup, for example, and you need uh, to do blood cultures. You don't have time to wait for lead to work. Uh, there are some drawbacks to using the vapor coolant. Um, you can't use it in children less than four years of age. Uh, we're not, we don't have time to talk about how the scales that are used to determine the severity of pain. Generally, for mild pain, you use Advil and Tylenol. For moderate pain, you can combine Advil and Tylenol. They have additive and synergistic effect on pain. And you consider oral opioids like oral morphine. Keep in mind that we don't use oral codeine anymore because of the issues with effectiveness or toxicity. And in severe case, you're using intranasal or IV opioids and considering IV NSAIDs for their opioid sparing effect. Um, these should be in this, the handout that I sent uh, in advance. Briefly, we'll uh, talk about three cases. Um, Four-year-old on the autism spectrum disorder, a fall that you determine requires uh, neuroimaging. In this case, uh, motion control is your goal, not so much analgesia. Uh, for the sake of the CT scan, of course, I have a fall from second story will be painful, so you'd be considering that. Um, the options here uh, as a way of suggestion would be IV propofol if there's no issues with blood pressure, but you need to sort of have advanced airway capabilities. Uh, or intranasal midazolam, but being aware of the unpredictable outcome with that. In the case of the seven-year-old that has this complex eyebrow laceration that requires uh, layered closure, um, you need anxiolysis as well as motion control and analgesia. So in this case, you might consider using intranasal fentanyl and midazolam. If you use them together, use the fentanyl first because the midazolam can hurt and use an atomizer, which has been shown to improve absorption. Nitric oxide is very effective uh, in uh, the older child, like usually more than four years of age, that can be coached to using that. And it works very quickly. And it allows the child the ability to titrate its use to the effect. And it would be an option in this case. And in the case of an eight-year-old with a, a a fracture that requires reduction in the emergency room, you'd require profound analgesia and motion control. And in this case, you might consider using IV ketamine um, or a combination of propofol and fentanyl or ketamine and propofol. Um, lastly, so as you see, I deliberately spent very little time on the medication to make a point that we should really explore all non-medication options first. Of course, there would be a place for medication like the cases that we, we discussed. 
Another reason to consider um, uh, non-medication ways of providing analgesia sedation is these uh, safety concerns of anesthesia in children. So to understand this effect, we need to understand this term apoptosis, which uh, basically means neuronal cell death. During synaptogenesis in the first few years of life, uh, sometimes neurons don't effectively link to each other. And so the brain has a way of destroying those cells. That's called apoptosis. So you can imagine if in those three year, first three years where there is rapid brain growth, there is neuronal generation and regeneration, synaptogenesis is very active, if you introduce a neurotransmitter blockade, which is what general anesthesia is, you can cause disruption in the linkage between the neurons, and you can activate at, at a massive scale this process of apoptosis. So it was found through animal studies where rodents that were subjected to things like ketamine, they were exhibiting behavior issues after their experiments. So then they looked at populations and they actually were able to show there are some neurodevelopmental issues in children that receive general anesthesia in the first three years of life. And that created this sort of ripple effect of really are, um, are we doing them any good by giving them general anesthetics for simple procedures like tonsillectomies, et cetera. And so this led to um, recommendation by, by Canadian Pediatric Society not to use ketamine as pre-medication for intubation and instead use fentanyl. The observations that were made was that if you use um, multiple anesthetic agents like ketofol or large doses of uh, anesthetics, multiple doses, continuous infusions at younger age, this uh, was more of a problem. So, and this is the last slide, I think the second last, the last slide. Um, there was then um, this sort of massive surge for evidence to this effect. And some investigators found counter arguments to this problem. Uh, and they were able to show that if you actually uh, look at the surgery itself or the pain itself that's poorly treated, or if you, use it, if you look at just using opioids for pain control, then you can actually see this apoptosis effect to the same degree. So what is the safest practice? Generally, the neutral balanced approach of avoiding general anesthetic and surgery as much as possible. Effectively and promptly treating pain because pain itself can cause this problem. And ensuring hemodynamic stability. So I hope um, I was able to communicate to you the importance of treating pain, because pain begets pain. Resorting first to physical and psychological means before pharmacology, but then if you have to use pharmacology, use them in conjunction with each other and treat treating pain acutely, promptly, and if possible, avoiding general anesthetics as much as possible. Thank you for your time.